morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, the book of Galatians, chapter 4. This is continuing our study from last week concerning being an adopted son of God. Doesn't it give you chills to think about it? To know that whatever lot you have in life, that you're going to move in to New Jerusalem and live in the presence of Almighty God for all of eternity. You're going to be part of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and a world that as far as us being able to know about it, what we know about it is from the Bible. And our eye hath not seen and our ear hath not heard of the things that God has prepared for us. We believe them from what we see in the Bible, but I don't think we can even imagine seeing it in the Bible, believing what the Bible says about what's coming. I don't think our minds can even draw the adequate picture of what it is that we're going to behold one of these days. We're going to be given freedom, liberty. We're going to be free from this wicked, miserable body and this wicked, miserable life and this world. We're going to be free from that, free from gravity. No more diets, right? No more problems with back and, you know, heart issues and your eyes going bad and no, no more bad news coming. God's wiping away all tears. And for what, for what did you do to deserve that? Not a thing. But it's just that Christ loved you and he wanted you to be part of his family. God adopted you in because he loved you. Mm. Now I say, this is Galatians 4 verse 1, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. And think about that. Think about Christ. Now he is our example in this. Christ, even though he was the Lord of all, stood there 12 years old, being surrounded by these men in the temple and he is speaking and they're just going you hear this guy what are you what are you what are you all of what are you 13 years old i'm 12 seriously you're 12 and they're just hearing this wisdom coming out of this 12 year old boy's mouth uh jesus is not standing before these men these men are standing before the lord of lords and king of kings, the Lord of life, the Lord of all. They don't know it. They're standing in front of God. And, you know, just the thought of that. And Jesus walked in among them and Jesus uh, slept with them and Jesus ate with them and Jesus spent 40 days starving to death in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted. Jesus mourned and grieved over his friend Lazarus who died. Um, he was hung on a cross, but he was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you think Jesus was our example in this, even though he was a child differing nothing from a servant being under tutors and governors, but he was Lord of all until the time appointed of the father. And every time I see that time appointed, I always think of, uh, Revelation 10, and the mighty angel comes down from heaven. What's my Bible? It's getting pretty tore up. But anyway, um, here we have a mighty angel coming down from heaven. I believe it's Jesus. Face as the sun, clothed with a cloud, his feet as pillars of fire. He is the angel, capital A angel, that Moses said God was going to lead them uh, into the promised land with. Uh, we have one pillar of fire in the Old Testament two pillars of fire in the new all right so anyway but he comes down with the book in his hand and uh verse six swear by him that liveth forever and ever uh who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer uh, it doesn't mean that time's going to all of linear time is going to come to a stop right then we know that a thousand years is going to be after this. So what does it mean that there should be time no longer? It's like your teacher when, when 
you know, 12 o'clock rolls around and you're taking your test and your teacher says, time's up. Okay, put your pencils down, stop writing, time's up. Now it's time for the judgment. That's what he means here. There should be, there should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. So the, uh, the time appointed of the father, I believe, is when this angel proclaims there is time no longer. Now it's time. Now he is going to be the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. I love that. Uh, it's the hallelujah chorus from Handel's Messiah. But I, at, when he said, time no longer, seventh trumpet, boom. Now we're going to, now we're going to do this. The mystery of God's going to be finished. Israel's going to have her eyes open. She's going to see everything. And then we are going to be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But right now we're under the elements of this world. We are living in this world, in this body. All right. Um, even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent, had sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Uh, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Joint heirs with Jesus. So we've been looking at this issue of being a son. John chapter 1, uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Romans 8, we are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Philippians 2, that we are the sons of God shining as lights in the world like stars. That's what the angels do right now. They are the stars and they're shining as lights in the world. We, the sons of God, the New Testament sons of God, are going to take at least one third of their place and shine as lights in the world. All right. Uh, in First John uh, chapter three, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Um, the world doesn't understand us. The world doesn't understand why we don't believe that, you know, the universe just popped into existence 13 billion years ago. They don't understand why we don't believe um, that we are, you know, the evolution of a species that started out as a primordial goo, a chemical scum, all right? Um, they don't understand why we don't believe we didn't come from monkeys. They don't understand why we don't believe that there are worlds throughout the universe that's inhabited by alien species. Do I believe in life? out beyond this planet earth absolutely they're called angels spirits some are devils some are good um they don't understand why we don't believe um the way the evolutionary scientists and the wicked people of this world believe and think they don't get us it's because they don't believe in god they don't believe the bible they don't believe in jesus christ they didn't understand him they're not going to understand us and what people don't understand they hate right that's what's coming they're gonna hate us all right that's coming you just mark it down beloved now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and every man that hath this hope in him in him purifieth himself even as he is pure second Corinthians chapter 6 that's where we uh, left off last week Let's pick it up here. Uh, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. There was a law in the Old Testament that said you couldn't hook an ox up with a donkey. Why? What abomination is that? Well, I mean, God has his reasons, but one of them that I can think of is it won't work. You have an ox that has all the beef, all the strength, uh, the physical strength, but then and just does whatever it's told. But then you have the donkey, 
doesn't have as much strength, but it's, boy, it sure is mule-headed. It's uh, donkey-headed. It doesn't want to do things. It resists. So you have one resisting and one pulling. And you're not going to get any work done that way. And so he gives us that same idea here. Here is a lost person and here's you. And the lost person is going to have the strength to go do a bunch of sin. And you say, I don't want to do that. But you don't really have a choice because you're yoked in with them. Wherever they go, that's where you go. That's, this is why I have not joined the Mormon church. This is why I haven't joined the Freemason Lodge or the Atheist Association of America. I don't know, Triple I just made that up. I don't know if there is one. But I don't belong to those organizations. Why? Because I don't believe in what they stand for. And if they're going to be using me and my financial resources for their cause. I don't want to be part of that. And you can say, well, you know, I belong to them, but you know, they do their own thing. I do my own thing. Well, but they're using you for resources. What are you going to do about that? Don't give them the resources anyway. You're going to do it. That's fine. I'm not going to stop you. But it's not going to be my money or my resources or my presence that's going to participate in this. And some people don't get that. They think they can belong to this club and that organization and this church and everything's okay. And, you know, I do my thing, they do theirs, you know, and, and you know, I don't see the big deal in it. Uh, well, God does. God does see the big deal in it. Um, you shouldn't belong to, I mean, it applies. We were told as young people, don't marry lost people. It makes sense. Don't, but now, but, but God, the lost people are really good looking. Okay? Don't, doesn't matter. Don't, don't join with them. Don't hook in with them. Don't yoke together with them because it causes problems. Um, I mean, I'm not going to give examples because I know too many people, but it just, it creates a lot of problems if those problems are not surmountable. Uh, I knew a lady from my childhood at this church that she and her daughter, they used to come faithfully every service. But her husband was resistant. He never would come. Preacher after preacher would go talk to him. I don't want to hear it. I don't want any part of it. Then his mom got involved, started creating problems, and basically said you know, her and her son together said, it's either us or that church. So she chose them. Never saw them again after that. You know, what a shame. What a shame. Some people just don't have the will and the power to resist people that are going the wrong direction. They just fall in for that. And God says, don't yoke together with them. Um, in the case of marriage, it happens. In the case of um, belonging to organizations, civic clubs, civic organizations, I'm not part of the ministerial alliance here in town. Okay, um, I'm not really all excited about working with Mormons, Roman Catholics, Jehovah's Witness, any groups like that. I'm I'm not really in for working with and you know getting along with people who don't believe the Bible. Okay? I'm not trying to be mean. I just can't I can't I'm not that kind of person. I can't just go along with people that I don't agree with. And so, I mean there's just many 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 ways that this can be applied in your life. And so he tells us not to be hooked in with them because they're going to want to go one way and we either find ourselves having to go with them or we have to pull out. We have to leave. And it, that in itself will cause a lot of problems. Some people find it hard to do that. If you're going to a, a book club and they're going to drink their wine and, and they're going to talk about Nietzsche or any other, in one of these godless, transcendentalist heathens, they're going to spit in the face of God. What are you doing there? 
because they're all going to surround you and they're going to say, well, he was a great thinker and this is what we need to be afraid of is people like you who believe the Bible and what are you going to do? They're going to make you, they don't want you there, number one. They have a spirit in them that absolutely does not want you there with your spirit. Now, come down off your high horse, quit believing the Bible, then maybe we can welcome you into our fellowship. And God knew me. God knew that I craved the, uh, I craved the attention and the favor of the men that I grew up under in the denomination. God knew that. God knew that I was doing things to get their attention so that they could pat me on the back and tell me what a good job they've watched me grow over the years and we want to tell you you're doing a tremendous job and we you know we can work with you in the denomination and you'll be asked to preach here before too long here on the big platform at the denominational meeting oh I wanted that I thought I thought that denomination was God's people doing God's work and could do no wrong. And whatever, you know, pockets of them didn't agree with me, I was going to straighten the whole group out. And God knew that as long as I was in with them, that I wouldn't speak out against them. So they didn't so much ask me to leave. I didn't so much say, I'm quitting as I just quit going to the meetings. I just quit showing up. And before too long, we're separated. We don't belong anymore. Our church is not part of any denomination. And now I can say, and I still have good friends that are, and I love them, and we fellowship because we all believe the same thing, but I keep telling them, look, at some point, you probably have to come out. And it won't kill you. You'll survive. You'll live past that. Um, but now I can say, hey, this is what the denomination's doing. They're wrong. They're wrong, not according to me, but according to the word of God. So, man, I get it. I, I wanted that favor. I wanted that attention. I wanted to rise up the ranks and have everybody notice me from the big platform of the denomination. And God said, I got different things for you. I got a different calling for you in your life. And so we unyoked ourselves. We unhooked. You go into a certain church or to a Bible study. Well, I'm the only King James person there and I'm, I'm trying to win them over. But really, you're an annoyance to them. And they either want you to shut up or they want you to leave. And at some point, they're going to ask you to do one or the other. Quit with your King James stuff or get out. Okay? You should probably get out because they're not going to back down. There's always going to be people in that group that are going to hate you and hate the Bible, even though it's a Bible study group. So anyway, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Christianity is a life of being called out of things that we probably should have never belonged to, to, in the, to begin with. We should have never been with these people, but you know it's an experience, learning experience. I get that. I've had it, but at some point you got to come out. Lot had to leave Sodom. Okay, Ruth decided that she was not going to be a Moabitess anymore. She was going to be a little Jewish girl, marry a Jewish boy, and be the great, 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 great grandmother of the Messiah. That's what God called her. Leaving the camp gave her that great name in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so there's Christ left the camp, Jerusalem. We're to follow him outside the camp. So we left the camp of the denomination. We left the camp of certain isms, certain ideologies. Okay? I've left the Republican Party. I'm not joining the Democrats. I'm just not going to be in with people that are going to trample down the principles that are in the Bible. I, I won't be part of that group. Um, 
For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? See, that's your whole yin-yang. I don't do karate and martial arts because of that. Because at its core is a lot of yin-yang ideology. And it's the yin-yang is, we believe that there's light and darkness and darkness and light. No, there isn't. Okay, What concord hath Christ with Belial? Here's the devil trying to make a concord with Jesus after 40 days in the wilderness. And Jesus said, nah, here's what the word of God says. And notice that the devil didn't stick around very long, did he? The devil didn't say, wow, you're right. Can I join your club? No, he's the devil. He's not getting saved. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? They have no part with us. They have no part telling us what to do or how to believe, right? So why are lost people writing Christian music and writing Christian books, sold in Christian bookstores? They have no part with us, and you have no part buying their books and reading them. You have no part singing their music. You have no part with that. They're infidels, okay? What agreement at the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of the living God no idol shepherd in your heart amen no Dagon no image of Mary no image no crucifix none of that stuff we have no part with idolatry zero um, as God has said I will dwell in them and walk in in them and I will be their God and they shall be I like seeing the four things in the Bible I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people all through the gospel of Jesus Christ wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you it's that simple and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So while a lot of people claim Christianity, a lot of people say, well, I'm a member down, you know, the First Lutheran Church or whatever. That don't mean snap with God. It doesn't mean a thing, okay? Because if you are still yoked with unbelievers, with unrighteousness, with darkness, with Belial, with infidelity, with idols, if you're still yoked in with that, God says, you cannot be my son. You cannot be my daughter, period. So, I mean, it comes with a price. But when we think about what we're going to gain and what we're going to receive as an inheritance, it's worth it. I mean, it's that, that idea of, of a man finds a pearl of great price. He sells everything that he has and he goes and buys it. I mean, if you, you know, if you found a piece of land somewhere and you were thinking about buying it and it was really cheap land out in the middle of the desert somewhere and yet you kicked over a rock and there's a big gold nugget about this big, you're going to cover that thing back up, buy that piece of property so you can have that gold. I mean, that just makes sense, right? I mean, that's what an investment is. You find a gold mine somewhere and you're going to invest in it so you can get a return. Well, in this case, it's going to cost you everything. But what you'll gain in return is beyond everything that you can ever imagine. That's what we're gaining so I know about the cost. It's worth it. I promise you. Now, Second Samuel. Here's an issue about being a son of God that, that God has taught me. It's been probably one of the greatest lessons I think God has taught me as far as being his child, being his son, and understanding the way salvation works. Okay? There is the... Um, Calvinist viewpoint of, you know, God has already predetermined, preselected everybody that he's saving and 
If you're not on that list, you're not being saved. Now, I believe that we are elect according to foreknowledge of God from before the foundation of the world. I get that. Okay? But it's not this idea that you don't even have to believe and God's still going to save you no matter what, whether you want to be or not. It, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It has everything to do with do you believe? Because salvation is still by grace through faith. And if there is no faith, there is no salvation. I don't care how many John Calvin Tulip things you can quote. It doesn't matter. If there's no faith, there is no salvation. And, you know, maybe I'm misunderstanding Calvinism. But this idea that you're pre-selected to be saved and salvation isn't really for everybody. Even though, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Um, and God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. And the Bible didn't really mean that, okay? But then there is the other idea. Um, people like um, uh, Finnis Dake who believed salvation's great. And salvation is free and if you sin ah too bad you just lost your salvation well it's just a little sin that doesn't matter you still lost your salvation can i get it back sure if you repent you repent you get your salvation back now you're saved again 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 well if i sin again after that will i still go to hell or heaven oh you're going to hell because you sinned now, you can get saved again. There is that extreme there. And I know there's extremes on both sides of this issue. But there's a lot of people that are kind of in here in various modes. Okay? And they have, a, I think, I guess, a pretty healthy understanding of salvation. Salvation is not a fool's game. Where God is just so foolish that he randomly selected, you know, 144,000 people or whatever to be saved and that's it you know stinks to be the rest of you whether you wanted to be saved or not it doesn't you're not on the list sorry you can't be saved i mean there's a lot of people who still take salvation seriously okay and i commend you for that because it involves a belief of the whole of the bible and a healthy fear of god no we can't pray a prayer at church one day and Everybody says, well, you're saved, you get baptized, and then you go out and be an atheist, lesbian, witch. Well, they're still going to heaven. Now, they're not going to get the rewards that I'm going to get, but they're still going to go to heaven, okay? Because you can't lose salvation. Nobody's even talking about that. Uh, nor is it, you better not sin, or you're on this little hair thread of salvation. If you sin, you're going to lose it. It's not that either. And a lot of people have this good healthy idea of salvation all right there are fringes out there on any ideology there's a lot of good people here in the middle all right but this helped me this gave me an understanding of it second samuel chapter 7 because it deals with a son and how god treats his sons and the bottom line is if god designates you as a son then you are eternally a son of God. That's God's designation, not man's. Man can say, oh, you, you prayed to prayer when you were seven? Oh, that's good enough. Or, you better get saved again, and again, and again, and again. I mean, there's those extremes, okay? So, how did God designate this title of being a son to Solomon. All right. Second Samuel chapter seven, verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, this is a promise that God made to David. When thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. And I will establish his kingdom. Now, two people are mentioned here. Number one, Solomon and Christ. Okay. Solomon typically um christ the fulfillment of the typology all right so he shall build an house for my name solomon 
Christ, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Amen. Period. If he commit iniquity, and Solomon did. Oh boy, did he. Um, did Jesus commit iniquity? No. And there's the fulfillment. There's always a perfect fulfillment, and that's always in Christ. All right? If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Now, Solomon was chastened by God because of his sins. Um, was Christ chastened? Yes. Not for his sins. For mine. That's that's pretty sobering thought. Okay. Um, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. Now, when I read this, I remember asking I, God I want to know what the difference is I mean I th thought I knew and I was right but I wanted to know it for sure why did God take his mercy away from Saul who's not in heaven okay he's he's not in heaven and I'm going to show you that biblically Solomon is in heaven and I'm going to show you that biblically, okay, with Bible verses that says this, okay. Uh, I'll give you one. Uh, Solomon. Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. Three books out of the Bible, okay. According to Peter, who wrote the Bible? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, if the Holy Ghost said that Solomon was holy, Solomon is holy. I mean, in spite of all the, the chicks and the pagan temples and all, yep, just like, just like you are. In spite of all your lusts, your pride and everything else that goes with you God sees you as holy that new man in you okay is holy because it's born of God it sinneth not uh, 1st John chapter 3 the old man boy does it sin the new man doesn't okay so God designates you as holy just like he did with Solomon holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and, and we have this promise that God would never take his mercy away from Solomon. Now, um, when you think of Solomon and you think of Saul, and I'm going to ask you this, and I, I, there's no way I have time today to really just dive into this okay, the way I need to. But I am going to deal with it. I'm going to deal with it with the Bible verses that I have here, and I think I'm going to add some more. Okay, but what is the difference? Because if you think of Saul, how many women did Saul sleep with? Well, we don't know. Fact of it is, I mean, we're told that Saul has a daughter, and we had, and he had sons. And, you know, Jonathan was one of them. Um, but other than that, we're not told about. Saul's nighttime activities. Did Saul drink strong drink? Did he ever drink, you know, whiskey and vodka and all that stuff, wine and well, we don't know. We're not told that. Did he cuss like a sailor? Maybe, but we're not told that either. Um, did he have a drug problem? We don't know that. In other words, all the dirty, nasty sins that you and I do and have done, we don't see that in Saul. We see something way worse than that. Okay? 
And yet we think of Solomon. We, my goodness, he had you know seven seven hundred wives and three hundred more women on top of that that weren't even designated wife. They're just concubines, which is another way of saying, "Hey, baby, okay, he's he slept with them. He did what he wanted to with them. They were his." servants in that way and you know you think about it how many different types of women are there probably about a thousand because I got it in my mind that Solomon had at least one of every face and body and personality type that there are amongst women Solomon had every one of them he had all the nice chariots he had all the fastest horses he had all the money he had all of the 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 wine he had parties he had music he spent seven holy years building the house of god and 13 years building his own house i mean he had everything right everything that every man has ever lusted after. Even, you know, men who have money and cars and women, nobody that I'm aware of, even the richest man in the world, doesn't have a thousand wives. Okay? And Solomon had an, all of it, all that he wanted for 40 years. And at the end of 40 years, and God allowed him. God allowed him to have all of that for a reason. I thought about this. Well, God, why did, why did he get to do that? And I thought, he's telling me, out of 12 chapters in the book of Ecclesiastes, he's telling guys like me, I had it all. And I was very empty. And it was vanity. It was vexation. God let me go do all these wicked things, but I kept my wisdom. And so Solomon is out, you know, building all these pagan temples, listening to all these evil women and lusting and doing all this stuff. He gets away with it. But he's pondering all of this as his life is going on at the end of his life. He's writing the book of Ecclesiastes and he's saying, guys, Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. Okay? Remember God while you still have the time in your life to do something about it. Because as an old man, Solomon is telling all of us men, it was a waste. I'm 51 years old, and I look back on 51 years of my life and say that most of it was a waste. Okay? Could I... If I could go back, would I do a lot of things differently? Oh my goodness, the number of things I would do differently. But I don't get that choice. I have to live with the mistakes as we do all. And Solomon writes to us as people and says, I have everything that you can imagine. I had it and it didn't give me, I'm going to die and my body's going to turn into the same corruption that my dog turned into. We all die. We have to go stand before God in judgment. So, God allowing Solomon to participate in all, not only, not only the immoral sins, the religious ones. Okay? How many, how many pagan temples did he build? One of each? Okay? And he builds, there's different gods and different doctrines and different theologies and Solomon is participating he's like the ecumenical man I am all religions okay and he participated in every one of them and yet at the end of his life he's turning back to the God of his fathers isn't he his heart did not attach to Baal or Milcom or Chemosh or any of these uh, Dagon or any of these other false gods that he built temples for and worshipped in and burned incense. He did, his heart didn't attach to any of those at the end of his life. His heart is turned to his creator. God wanted it that way. 
He's telling all of us who've ever been in any kind of other ideology and theology, come to the Lord your God. Come to your creator, Jesus Christ. Because that's who he ended up with. Okay? Now, was he a son of God? Yes. Did God ever take his mercy away from him? No. Now that is a guarantee that if God designates you as his son, not what a church told you, not what a preacher told you, but what God tells you. If God tells you, you are my son, you are my daughter, then what he says along with that is, I promise you, I will never take my mercy away from you. So then that raises the issue of sin. Can I, as a Christian, as a child of the living God, still sin? The answer is, as long as you're willing to take the beating for it. As long as you're willing to allow God to tear the hide off you, to do what my mother did to me often times, to whip me, chastise me, punish me, make me cry. Okay? As long as you're willing to take the beating, go do the sin. Okay? No, no, I do not have a licentious a uh, liberal idea of sin and salvation. Not in any way, shape, or form. It's a very serious thing, and God deals with it seriously. Some of the things, in fact, everything I've ever done has always been forgiven by God. But he's made me take the consequences with it. I live under certain things that I will never get out from underneath in this world. That's hard. That's hard to take. Knowing that even years after things I've done wrong, I still have to deal with them. Okay? It's just like, you know, if you were young and you and a girl, you got a girl pregnant and she had your kid He's not been part of your life and you have to deal with this fact that you have a son or a daughter out there or you're a woman and you had a child before wedlock and they gave it up for adoption or whatever. I mean, you have to deal with this permanent thing that there's a child out there with your genes that you didn't raise or that you did have to pay for in some way. I mean, those... Just because God forgave the sin, he didn't just wipe the child away and say, we're going to forget about that. No, it's still real. It's still a very serious thing that you got to deal with in life. And my point is this. As long as we're willing, um, let's go to Hebrews 12, because Hebrews 12 says it better than I'm rambling. Um, as long as you're willing to allow God to chastise you as his son, then you are his son. Okay? So, Hebrews 12, um, verse 6, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's the deal. If you want God to receive you as his son, as his child, then he has the right to scourge you, to chasten you. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Now, you know what I used to think? I used to think that verse was different. I used to think that verse said, then you become bastards and not sons. It does not say that. It says you are bastards. And God knew it. This is why God never accepted you, received you as a son. Because he knew you would not accept the chastening. God knows that. God doesn't accept and receive as sons those whom have not or will not receive the chastening. It's that simple. So nobody becomes a bastard. They just 
are because they won't let God correct them. They won't let God chase them. They're stubborn, okay? Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. So, to me it is very simple now that I now that I know this and I've seen it with my own eyes from the scriptures. This is what I believe. And you can say, well, you know, that's, you know, eternal security or that's, you know, um, Ar Arminianism or I don't care what you call it. I don't really care about being in anybody's ism. What I care about is knowing where I stand with God. I don't like to take this and apply it. Well, that person obviously there, that person obviously is a bastard. I mean, they're, they're no son of God. They're obviously not saved, not ever going to be. How do we know the outcome of their life? We don't. So I don't like to take this and apply it as judgment to everybody. What I know is, I know where I stand with God. I am a son of God. God has always had mercy on me. But he's always chastened me. Many times. Okay? And so, we're willing to take that chastening. God accepts us as sons and he never takes his mercy away from us. Never. So, why did he take it from Saul? Some would say, well, it's because that's in the Old Testament. It's in the Old Testament. It's different. No, that's not it. That's not it at all. There is something that Saul did that is the one thing crucial to salvation. This one thing that Saul did, absolutely crucial. And God doesn't give salvation without it. Faith. Faith. Saul just quit believing God. Did he believe? Absolutely. We'll look into Saul's life. We'll see where he started, where he ended up. And it fits perfectly with everything in the Bible where salvation is, well, I believe this ism, but this part of the Bible doesn't really teach that. It teaches against it. To me, it fits perfectly with Hebrews 6, fits perfectly with Second uh, Peter uh, chapter, what is it, chapter 2, okay, where the latter end is worse than the beginning. That's Saul. And that's what we're going to look at next week. Now, you do your own study. 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 15 is, is our key area here dealing with sons. I'm going to be in Psalm 89. And I'm going to be in 1 Samuel in several places. Okay? So you go examine Solomon's life. Read the book of Ecclesiastes, 12 chapters. Okay? And then read these passages. And then see what God tells you. See what God shows you. Okay? But. Well, John Calvin was a great man, and he wrote, I don't care who John Calvin is, he wasn't an apostle nor a prophet of God. Neither was Arminius. Okay? Neither was this denomination or that denomination. We believe what God's Word says. All right? That's what makes us sons. That we believe what God said. We still may not, at the end of the day, see 100% perfectly eye to eye but I know you believe God's word. I hope you know I believe God's word. God will teach us as we go along. All right? I love you. It's a joy to sit down in God's word with you. All right? You're the reason why we do what we do. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.